Okay, I'm Jim Holland, and this is Design at Large. Uh, I'm really, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce Tom DeFonte, uh, who's our speaker today. He's really one of the incredible pioneers of scientific visualization. Uh, and like many Design at Large speakers, uh, I can't tell you his whole list of uh, awards and things. He's a fellow of uh, uh, ACM, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and he's had like a tremendous impact on, I think, SIGGRAPH and that whole organization uh, right from the start. He's, uh, he chaired uh, SIGGRAPH for a number of years. Uh, he was, I think, influential in starting the electronic theater, which is sort of my favorite part of SIGGRAPH uh, kind of meetings. Uh, and he also started SIGGRAPH video reviews. Uh, which I think was very influential in getting out to a large population uh, some of the things going on. Uh, he did his PhD at Ohio State uh, University. Uh, he created the GRASP programming language uh, for uh, doing three-dimensional real-time animation. Uh, I asked Larry to give me some uh, things to embarrass him with. Uh, but uh, he, he knows too much about Larry, so Larry didn't tell me anything. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but he did mention, he reminded me that grass had been used to do the only 3D computer graphics in the original Star Wars uh, system, which is sort of uh, very interesting. Uh, personally, I came across Tom's work, uh, maybe before many of you were born, but uh, in 1987, uh, he led a panel uh, that I uh, co-chaired a panel on visualization and scientific computing. Uh, and uh, that was back in the days, I think Gordon Bell was uh, associate director of SIZE. Uh, that was the days when NSF had just funded five supercomputing centers around the, the country. Uh, ARPA, I think, had just become uh, NSFNet in those days as it was transitioning. And uh, the panel had just an amazing set of folks in addition to uh, Tom. Uh, Alvy Ray Smith, who's talked in the series, founder of Pixar, uh, Jim Blinn, Jim Clark, uh, Turner Whitehead, Fred Brooks. Uh, and the report, which I was very much influenced by, uh, described visualization as emerging as a sort of a major new field uh, and of applying computers in science. Uh, and is offering a way to see the unseen. And I think a lot of what people have worked in visualization have worked on is to try to make the invisible visible uh, kind of things. And that report uh, really heralded this. Uh, they re recommended a new initiative to get visualization tools in, quote, the hands and minds of scientists. Uh, and I think that uh, that's had tremendous impact. And I don't think there's, there's few people who've done as much to accomplish that of getting these kind of tools into the hands and minds of scientists as Tom. Uh, and today he's gonna to tell us some of his recent steps in that direction. Uh, after the talk, he's going to invite you over to see uh, some of this actually running, uh, the wave stuff, uh, and we'll uh, all troop over there to see it. Uh, he's gonna talk about big VR for big data uh, and the next wave, uh, and as a surfer, I love using the acronym of WAVE uh, of sort of wide angle virtual environments. So he's gonna tell us about the present. So thank you for that setup. You uh, really did things. Now, truth be told, the visualization report, which got everybody to change their business card to have the word visualization in it, there were two things. It's, first of all, Alvi was the first one to start using that term with respect to computer graphics. We had the electronic visualization lab decades decade and a half before in Chicago. It's a good word. And it melded then computer graphics and image processing or pattern recognition, which are two very different fields, and they still are, but they needed to talk to each other. So that was, an, and this um, typical of Larry, he had this idea, and then he said, Tom, you do it. So I'm still here, and I'm still doing Tom, you do it stuff, and I was doing it right up until 4 o'clock today. <laughs> And so on. So I'm going to, um, this of course is the star cave up here and uh, people who have contributed to these things uh, among many others. Um, and uh, 
I'm going to really talk to you about big VR today, since everybody's talking big data and big everything, you know. But, you know, everybody, however, is focusing on little VR, you know, the kind you stick on your head. So I'm going to talk about big VR. But before we go there, I'm going to start with a couple of videos. And the first one is a video that was made in 1977, actually, about the Star Wars work that we did in 1976. Now, this was extremely laborious. It took us months to do this 45 second thing that was very primitive. It was kind of intentionally primitive. George Lucas wanted it to look primitive. Better computer graphics were available then, but they looked kind of like his models. And he wasn't interested in that. He wants them to look like a computer did it, right? And a long time ago, far, far away. So um, this thing, I could go a whole hour on this particular thing. Um, you know, all I, I want to say a couple of things is that this is 40 years ago. And I was 27 years old at the time. Now, how many of you in this audience are 27 years old or younger? Come on, raise your hands. Okay, so just think about what you're going to be doing in 40 years. Okay? Now, this is what uh, Jim was talking about when I first ran into Larry. He had um, uh, put this NSF net thing together with NSF and a bunch of other people. And here, this thing was running at 56 kilobits a second. Now, that was essentially what a digital phone line, analog phone line, can do. And, uh, but that was 200 times faster than the 300 BPS modems we were using to connect to our computers, or any of you who actually remember that kind of acoustic coupling stuff. Um, so that was a big deal, although when I first met Larry, I was in the audience and I raised my hand and I said, well, I don't understand how you're going to change science with something that communicates at one-tenth the speed of my Apple II floppy to the Apple II, you know. And um, Larry uh, said, uh, I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> and I started working for him. So that was, uh, that, was this, that story. And that was 1987, I guess? Six. 1986. Um, so what's happened in between? We developed an incredible amount of, um, of uh, networking uh, technology. And I've been in the middle of that uh, for a variety of reasons that in mostly have to do with the fact that people who fund this stuff want to see things. And um, networking people really don't know how to do that. And so they want, to, they want it's the National Science Foundation, not the National Networking Foundation. So they wanted somebody to show applications. And, uh, but then it kind of stalled. We did this major build out in the 90s, the late 90s. And then it kind of stalled for a little while. And mid last decade, uh, Arden Bement, who was the director of the NSF, um, said basically that we've got too much data. We've got these great, great national networks. But by the, when they hit the campuses, they essentially go onto dirt roads. And, uh, that really had to improve the campus infrastructure. Now, it took years before these things, as typical, got into practice. And NSF funded a second generation of network upgrades, which our campus has actually been at the forefront of and gotten two of those awards. Meanwhile, the Department of Energy decided to do a thing they called the Science Demilitarized Zone, which is a way of optimizing science data transfers to get around the fact that most of our networking comes through piles of equipment to keep out the bad guys. But if you cleverly pre-filter the bad guys, in other words, you trust who you're getting stuff from, you can get rid of all that stuff. And so this is part of what we're doing next. And I'm going into this very quickly. Um, so NSF then um, funded over 100 campuses to build these DMZs based on the, the uh, ESnet concept. And uh, the one that we built here, the Phil Papadopoulos is the PI of, is called PRISM. It goes all over campus. It runs mainly at 40 gigabits per second, um, which is very fast. And it's allowed us to put together things as complicated as this, where people connect to supercomputers, um, several supercomputers, all for the same project, our big biz screens, um, huge data stores and so on, and out to the labs themselves. In order to do this, Phil Papadopoulos designed a thing that I named Fiona for Flash I.O. Network Appliance that uses flash memory, solid state disks, to keep up with the networking. The problem with networking is if you come crashing into the campus or anything and can't keep up with it, 
the networking protocols, TCP, tell the network, tell the thing to back off. And it takes a while for it to get back up to speed, and then it backs off again. And so if you ever looked at networking charts, they look like this, which of course is, uh, doesn't work. And so you have to make it so the thing that you're, that's receiving it can take it as fast as it's coming to it. And that was the whole tuning of this. We've actually known how to do this for many years, but the scientists wouldn't use the protocols that we came up with, so we decided to program around it. Uh, a year ago, we did this thing to prove that it could work and got you know, up to 36 gig out of 40 to various places and 9.6 out of 10. Uh, Scenic developed these, these dashboards to show all the interconnections of these campuses. Now, here's an example of trying to do something between here and the University of Amsterdam. Uh, where they had a what they call a policer, which was something that was looking closely at the packets coming in, and it was running really, really slow. And this policer had been there for years and years, and nobody even remembered it, but it was in the way. And by with months of work, of um, as uh, Phil Popolis calls it, skinning your knuckles, uh, one day they unplugged that thing, and look what happened. It went from nothing to you know almost seven gigabits a second, and this is over you know, 10,000 kilometers, right? So, um, so we built this thing called the Pacific Research Platform, and NSF funded it uh, to hook together 20 universities, uh, mostly on the West Coast, and uh, as a regional experiment of how to kick this into the, the next gear. Um, and now we have um, these, uh, these things are called MED dashes, and I don't even know what MED stands for, and dash is obviously dashboard. Uh, and you can mouse over this thing and see what anybody's doing between the transfers that we run several times a day as tests, and, um, and see what's going on. So we're now bringing this back up after we started this project uh, and got the funding, we're bringing it back up between the campuses, and we've pushed this all over to layer three now. It was layer two, and if you don't know what that means, it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so, but where's all this big data coming from? So uh, there is a project called Jupiter Hub at Berkeley and our pattern recognition non von Neumann computing lab here that's just started. There is biomedical, earth sciences, particle physics, astronomy and astrophysics, and scalable visualization. Um, so I'm, again, I'm running through these fast because I lost some time. So um, we've been building these boxes. These Fiona boxes are quite expandable. And here's one that's got 28 cores of CPUs, um, uh, some flash, and a lot of um, uh, NVIDIA. It's got 15,000 NVIDIA cores and dual 40 gigabit NICs. So, and this is just a box, right? It just fits there. It's this big, you know, 3U. Three, three and uh, it's a supercomputer, right? I mean, it's from a supercomputer a few years ago. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's about 20 grand. Uh, which, you know, for any of you who actually pay bills, that's, that's what one grad student costs for one quarter. So it's not a lot of money. Um, we've also just started with this uh, pattern recognition lab. So, Jim, here's, I'm giving you a whole bunch of lectures to, to each one of these is a, a beautiful lecture. This is a chip. It's, this thing it fits in is the size of my phone here, but maybe twice as thick. And it's... Um, it has uh, 256 million synapses and a million neurons. Um, and, uh, you know, this is IBM's True North chip. Uh, Javier Gerardo here has just come to us back from Qualcomm after he did his PhD dissertation with me in this area uh, years ago and went off to Qualcomm. And now we've hired him back to work on this project. And we're really happy about that. Okay, now I'm going to move to VR. So I picked up this cartoon from 1951, which are the early days of home television. Look what it says. One nice thing about television, you don't have to pick out where to look. So what are they referring to here? They're referring to the fact that a sports game or theater or whatever, you, get, you look all over the place and you actually have to figure out where to look. But on TV, they tell you. Well, we blew that up with VR because now you don't know where to look anymore, right? We ruined TV. So this was the first cave we built, and um, uh, Larry had a lot to do with this too. Uh, the first one was in Chicago. The second one was in, um, in Urbana at NCSA where Larry was. The third one was at Argonne. The fourth one was at DARPA. And, uh, but it was expensive. This is what you're going to see later. Uh, this is the wave 
Um, it's got, um, uh, we built this a couple of years ago, it's 35 megapixels per eye instead of one megapixel per eye. And instead of a dollar a pixel, it's a tenth of a, it's a penny a pixel. Okay, so that's, that's good. You know, orders of magnitude are always good. This room also has a terabit network in it, which of course was inconceivable not too long ago. Uh, but here we go. And this is a, uh, this was the original vision I had for these caves was that um, I happen to be in a, getting a suit for when I used this for a lot of money. And the, um, uh, I was standing in a tailor's mirror and said to myself, well, gee, this kind of works. If I move over here or over here, I can see that there's no occlusion, that the image moves with me. And you know, one of the things we learned from doing ray tracing was that you know, light goes both ways. You know? I mean, in the real world, it only goes one way. But in computation, it's sometimes a good deal to make it go the other way. It simplifies it. So I said, why don't we build something that replaces the screens in a tailor's mirror with um, you know, screens? Now, it turned out we could only do it with projectors back then. But now we can do it with big home TVs. So here's the thing we built a year ago or so, and two years ago. And uh, this thing is now down to half a center pixel. And, um, and it works really well. So those of you, we've got this one over in the Shiley Eye Center now to help figure out who is, um, uh, who's, uh, uh, as some, I, some wayfinding experiments for people who have onset Parkinson's um, as, a, as a test. So how do we take these pictures? We've seen these a bunch of different images. And the rest of this thing, which I'm going to race through now, is, um, is about how do we get these realistic images. These images exceed your visual um, acuity, which is something that you don't get out of head-mounted displays. And you won't for some time. Well, head-mounted displays are kind of fuzzy looking, like the cave was in 1992. Um, and, um, uh, but there are techniques that we've perfected to take at least still images in stereo. And again, you'll see some over in the wave. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you how we take these. Now, LIDAR and structure for motion, which is what was used in the, um, in the uh, baptistry, the Florence imagery <coughs> that I showed you as a second video, is a different lecture. Another lecture for you to, um, to propose, Jim. So a friend of mine named Dick Ainsworth, who I've been working with since 1973, uh, developed this camera system with Dan Sandeen. Uh, and it is basically two snapshot Lumix cameras uh, that are on a GigaPan robot. And, um, and we generate, uh, we take this thing out in the field. So here's uh, Tom Levy with um, David and Alia, off in a beautiful place in Greece. And, um, and here I am in Egypt four years, five years ago, know, five years ago, uh, during the revolution there, um, and um, taking pictures. So what happens, you get 72 images for each eye, so 144 together like this. You stitch them together, and the image looks like that. But when you wrap it back around a sphere, basically, it looks like that. And I'm going to show you in a second, since I can't do this, I used to be able to do this inside of these things. I'm going to pop out and just show you one of these things in real life here. And let me move it over. Did I make it big enough? And then this is, you know, goes around like that. I'm going to do it slowly so I don't make you dizzy. But this image is so good that there was a, uh, the current governor of of Wisconsin um, uh, successfully uh, limited the power of unions to negotiate for salary increases. And the, uh, peop the workers um, uh, stayed they sit in, in this building. And um, part of the response of the uh, government in Wisconsin was to claim that the um, protesters had damaged the building. Now, it just so happened. We had this ultra-resolution thing, and we pointed out that the cracks were already there and that there was no damage. So anyway, I felt particularly proud about that. Being, I, you know, I went through college on a union scholarship, so I really am a union sympathizer. OK, so how do we, um, let's try and 
comes back without crashing. Good. Okay. So we got a. We wanted now the problem with this cave cam system is that anything's moving in the scene, including clouds or people, anything. It doesn't work because the stitcher can't work, and it's very hard to do uh, um, high dynamic range because it takes too long to take the pictures and something changes, whether it's the shadows or whatever. So uh, we got uh, three and a half million dollars through uh, NSF uh, from here and. Uh, Trong's the, the, the uh, PI of the subcontract here. Trong Nguyen is the head of the EC department. There's a whole gang of us working on this thing. And the goals of this are to take a full 360 by 180 at 30 frames per second video uh, to get the acuity up to what we're used to, which is a half a gigapixel per eye, basically. Um, in other words, as good as you can see, and, uh, and to make it re reproducible so that people can use it. So here's the pictures we had from the grant a couple of years ago. And these are based on a prototype I'll show you in a minute that worked. Um, and uh, these are Raspberry Pi cameras, which you can't get anymore. And here's what it looks like in an exploded view. Now, notice that cabling becomes the key problem in a lot of these things. And also, the, um, there's, there's a bunch of technical issues about how to get the cameras to be in stereo at your interocular distance, which you want, and also to um, uh, synchronize and have global shutters and all these kinds of things that just don't fall into your lap. Lots of different concepts. This is one. Harlan Baker is a guy who works with us. He is from HP. And um, he. Uh, He's been working on this stuff for a long time. In fact, that cross-eyed thing we just showed you, he had a patent on it until HP decided they didn't want the patent anymore and just didn't want to defend it and just released it, which is great for us. And um, this is a, a different thing. This is taking advantage of the fact that um, depth, you need less information for depth than you need for um, your visual acuity. And so this camera's basically got little cameras that are taking a lot of de getting a lot of depth information, and big cameras, so to speak, big cameras that are focusing on higher resolution images. This is a different thing from the stitching we're using. This is really not trying to re reconstruct 3D from the um, from all of these cameras. It's a very different concept. Our test system uh, was using these Raspberry Pis, and that's the size of the of the sensor, it's the kind of thing that's in your phone. Um, we built this prototype, which actually worked. Again, notice that the cables are bigger than anything. Um, and um, we were able to make it work in video and in stills. Uh, and then the, Pi, the Raspberry Pi went away, and the spy cam thing came out, and it turns out you can make it a lot smaller. From our test, the critical diameter of something like this is like six inches. Uh, smaller is better. Um, Eight inches, and you, that's another whole lecture. You can't actually resolve the stereo very well. Now, it turns out that this idea has occurred to a lot of people. So this is a quick set of people who are doing this in one way or another. And um, uh, because it's an obvious thing you want to do, if you're going to have all these head-mount displays out there, you've got to make images, right? And you're not going to make them all with computers, right? Because you want to see real things. And uh, it'll mix real things and so on. And of course, it's so much easier to do point a camera at something than it is to actually create it so from scratch. So um, this is an obvious idea. And, um, and of course, now that Google's into it, it's about time for us to get out. Um, but also, so is Microsoft, and so is Facebook, of course. And so is, uh, and I'm gonna, the rest of the lecture is going to be talking about for a few minutes just about this. So people say, that uh, the cumulative worldwide sales of VR head mount displays will reach 200.1. I love the accuracy. Million units during the period uh, from now through to 2020. And then there'll be 76 million units a year, 76.7 million units a year. And the, uh, you know, the revenue will be $21.8 billion, I guess, in, uh, in 2020 dollars with a compound annual growth rate of 142%. So, you know, if you believe this, this is the place to put your, you know, your retirement savings in. Um, and um, uh, again, you know, I don't know where they get this from, but 
Lots of people are jumping into it. This is the Samsung Gear and Project Beyond. Beyond is the camera. Looks surprisingly like the camera, like, like um, uh, our Camelot, except it's, in fact, I'm sure they read the same patents. It's, um, uh, but it's lower res. Now, if you're trying to measure, match the res of resolution of a cell phone, it's not so hard. Not so hard. But it still looks like crap, right? So, so here's one that's trying to be a bigger one. And, um, and this one has a lot of cameras, but they're not shooting in stereo. They're trying to create a high-res scene. Now, if you have enough overlap, you can actually make this work. If you throw away like 60% of your pixels or 80% of your pixels, you can actually do a good job of recreating the scene. And there's a discussion of it I'm not going to go through. Uh, but they basically say doing it in stereo doesn't work. Uh, GoPro has a thing like that. Um, a lot of people make little uh, frames to put GoPros in. Um, there's a company called Jaunt who has this lovely space age looking thing which is pretty close to the same deal. And I'm, I'm not going to start going downhill. Okay? We started out the not obtaining them to expensive stuff. Um, Nikon has a camera which I think, I don't know if it's for sale yet, but they certainly have, I think you can pre-order it. It's got two lenses on it. and. Um, there's a problem with doing really wide angle lenses though because the stereo collapses at the edges. So it's, you know, in head mounted displays, we're assuming that if you're looking at a rock concert or whatever they're trying to do that, um, um, you know, you're, you're not really gonna expect to have stereo. A lot of these things really don't do stereo anyway. Um, here's one that does, they claim, the Nokia $60,000 box. Now it shoots in front in stereo and up and down it's mono and of course obviously it doesn't shoot in back because it's got no cameras back there. Here's one that I like because it, uh, it doesn't do stereo but it, um, um, so you understand what's different, 360 is a single surround image versus stereo which is effectively two, one for each eye. Um, now this one cleverly solves the problem of where do you put it? You know, so it, when you have a camera, you know, cameras, you point a camera out, right? You've got the cameraman, camera person, frames the scene, there's all this stuff about cameras and their framing and everything else. And when you throw all of it away, um, you know, I wrote a paper a long time ago called The Defenestration of Windows, and joke that nobody got. But the, because defenestration in English doesn't mean removing windows, it actually means jumping out of a window, but it's a different, different thing. But what do you do when you've got cameras all over the place, you know? Where do you go? Where's the camera person going to be? You know, it's, you know, selfie all the time? You know, yeah, that's one way to do it, and it's probably going to be the dominant thing. But, you know, you stick the thing on something, or on a tripod, or hang it, or throw it up in the air, or do something with it so we can take pictures all around without having you in it, and then of course you need remote control. Fortunately, it's trivial. So these things, um, you know, we're going downhill in price now. Here's the thing called bubble cam that you can, some of these things you can buy, you know, and get them in two days with Amazon Prime. Um, here's the thing called, me, we make VR, and I haven't been able to figure out the, uh, the cost of this one, but it's doing, trying to do stereo cameras, and everybody in the field has pretty much figured out that isn't going to work like that. Okay, it's, it's one of those things that looks like it should work, and you could probably write a grant proposal about it, but it doesn't work. So here's a, um, a little uh, frame that somebody made for Hero uh, 360 Hero GoPros, and um, um, you know, it's a lot of money for a frame. Uh, and of course, the next person comes along and makes it for half the price or a tenth the price. Here's another one that's doing stereo, a um, couple of stereo things. This one, I don't think you can actually buy. Um, here's one that is kind of the cutest one. And um, for $500, <clears throat> Kodak's got like half of the Nikon one for $399. Um, and then there's the Kickstarter version one. So here's one that uses a trick that you can't do in stereo, but you can do in mono, of pointing a camera up into a parabolic uh, 3D lens, uh, circular parabolic lens. And, um, but you know, as these people are trying to do this Kickstarter, here somebody's got one, Jurgen has one of these things for $349. And then there's the Ricoh Theta compact camera, which you can buy and exists and works. And it's the size, you know, the little thing, right? Half the size of a cell phone. 
and it actually uh, does a pretty good job in mono. Um, and then this thing, which I assume is called the fly because you throw it up in the air, but I don't know. Um, here's another one that was actually meant to go on your, I think originally on your dash, on the dash of your car. Uh, we're going downhill now. Um, so here's something that fits on your iPhone and uses that same idea, but it's only $30, amazingly enough. And all the way at the bottom I could find was uh, this accessory for the iPhone, which is the same principle, for $14. Now, how can you make something for $14 bucks that works like that? I don't know. You, you basically have something, the resolution is so bad that um, it's, it's just a gimmick. Now, I got really excited when I saw this. So, of course, I was searching in Google, shopping and finding things. So here's a VR360 digital camera bag. So I think, wow, this is when, when they start to accessorize these things, you know, when there's a, a camera bag, and when I first saw it, I said, wow, this is for you, like your Oculus Rift or something, you know, they're accessorizing. You know, next thing I have little, little dingles that hang off them or something, you know, like so forth. <laughs> and then I look carefully, and this Olympus does have a camera. It is called the VR360, but it's a regular snapshot camera. It happens to be pink. And it's just a regular snapshot camera. They called it the VR360 for some reason, but it didn't, um, it isn't. It's just a snapshot camera. But I, I, again, I got kind of excited. Um, so uh, my question to you ending this up is, what are you going to be doing 40 years from now? You know, those of you who will be around then, which is more than half of this room. Um, and um, these are only the current grants that we have and collaborators. Um, I've been very lucky. Uh, I was a poor uh, faculty member uh, using uh, consulting funds to populate my laboratory uh, with equipment, and I ran into Larry, and he got me addicted to money, and that was 30 years ago. Um, so um, anyway, these are all the people who fund us, and if you do, a presentation like this and you have an NSF award, it's actually critical that you put a slide like this in, in case you've never noticed. So with that, I want to stop and have a few minutes for uh, questions, and then we'll take anybody who wants to over to the wave. So thank you. All right, who's got a question? You've got a question, Jim, I'm sure. Okay. One, I, uh, I actually worked uh, on VR stuff a little bit uh, as an undergraduate at Brown, so mm -hmm. it was really fun that to, to, your tour was, was really great. And one thing that um, the, uh, you can sometimes think about creative ideas as being like stocks. And I feel like virtual reality and speech are two stocks where for many decades now, the stock price has been higher than warranted by the short term, what happens in the short term. And yet, I think there is a fundamental intuition there that, that makes sense. And with speech, we're actually starting to see some things change. So for, I don't know, decades now, we've been promised that speech was three years off. And then it actually all of a sudden started working. And I'm curious whether, I mean, it seems like Certainly, Silicon Valley this year has decided that VR is at that point right now. Um, but I'm curious what you see, you know, clearly for medical applications or other you know, buildings, uh, VR is going to be transformative. What are some of the other domain areas where, where you're excited about? Oh, that's a hard question. You know, if I knew, then I'd probably be working at Apple or Google today. Um, that is a hard question. Well, I think my, where I'm putting my money, which is the chancellor's money, is into building a VR lab in the basement in the old Moxie space. And so we're putting a lot of money, a couple hundred thousand dollars, into building a state-of-the-art student-oriented, you know, student-centered VR lab that will have like 40 Oculus Rift systems and other stuff. And, um, uh, you know, because the thing that we can compete best here is teaching students to do these kinds of things, right? I mean, uh, how do you compete with the billions and billions that Oculus and, and Hollywood and other people are putting into content development, and you do it by doing what they can't do, which is teach people. And to, and to get people to push, their, push the envelope, to get the artists involved, who are the ones who push the envelope in our field. 
I've always worked with, art, with artists as um, fundamentally is what I, as part of what I do. So that's, that is um, uh, an important observation. Now the other trick is getting the tools, the software and the hardware at a level in which they're essentially throwaways. So I remember I used to tell my students that there'd be a revolution of computing when computers cost less than three-year-old Buicks. Of course, that was a long time ago, you know. Um, now it's less than three-year-old Buick toys, right? Um, so um, that, th that has changed. The quality, of course, of the head-mounted displays will only get better. Um, you know, one of, our, uh, one of the things that came and went rather critically, uh, rather briefly, was the 3D TVs. And part of that is because it's really hard to shoot 3D. And actually, you know, it just changes the paradigm. Now, it works better with video. It works better with VR. It doesn't work with romance. I mean, 3D romance just doesn't matter. It's annoying, as a matter of fact. You know? um, so there, everybody always tries to make the new medium do what the old medium did, but maybe faster or a little glitzier or something. And this is really, a, as you say, a paradigm shift. It's a change in the way things are um, done. And we have to uh, get it in the hands of students, because they're the ones who are going to do it, right? Um, and this, this lab will include good audio, you know, three uh, Shrooks, um, uh 3D audio stuff, and so on, um, and make it so people can do things that we've never seen before. Now, this is what I liked always being about computer graphics, is I got to work with top scientists, as they would say, and uh, to help them visualize things that they'd never seen before. And I'd sure never seen them before. I mean, way back when I was a graduate student, I was working with a, a math professor, and I programmed up something he did. And remember, everybody else was using punch cards. And I was using this wonderfully interactive system, this PDP-11. And um, I looked at him and said, is that what it's supposed to look like? He said, I don't know. No one's ever seen one of these before. You know, that was kind of a transformative moment. Um, so that's um, I, really, I mean, my effort and money is going into the students here. So, next question. Anything else? All right. Well, I know I've overloaded you, and you don't have questions to ask. I think so. everyone wants to see it. Okay. Once again. All right. Is, is that what you don't want to delay that? Okay. Fine. Let's go.